This is the Scandal of Reading podcast. Join Jessica Hooten Wilson, author of The Scandal of Holiness, and her co hosts, Claude Acho, author of Reading Black Books, and Austin Carty, author of The Pastor's Bookshelf, for inspiring conversations about why Christians should be reading great literature. In each episode, the host will also be dialoguing with writers about books they love and why these books matter for the life of the believer. This podcast is sponsored by Brazos Press. Brazos Press publishes books that creatively draw upon the riches of the Christian story to deepen our understanding of God's world and inspire faithful reflection and engagement. A Brazos Press book that I recommend is my latest, Reading for the Love of God, How to Read as a Spiritual Practice. In this book, I show how to read as a spiritual practice in a way that encourages humility, increases charity toward others, frees minds and hearts from the trappings of contemporary idols, and gives direction toward contemplation. Get 30% off and free shipping at bakerbookhouse.com. All right. This is a uh, question I really like to ask folks. What is a novel that you have read in a 24-hour period? Or like loosely defined, like but close to twenty four hours. Just something that you you picked up and just grabbed you. You could not put it down. Um, maybe name something, and then a little bit about why. Like what what thing about that particular work drew you in? So do you know? I think this is fun in the age of streaming shows or streaming movies to be able to answer this question because I'm going to go out on a limb and just hypothesize that what it is about novels that keep us hooked that way for 24 hours is the same impulse that makes us binge watch. There's something about the novel's ability to hook and also demand that we know the ending that makes us just keep Mm -hmm. going. Like we're, we're going to keep reading because we have to know how it ends. Like there's some sort of problem that grips us So for me, when I, and I don't know if it was affected by where I was in that stage of my life, but when I was single and I was studying literature at the University of Dallas, I had never read Jane Austen. And so we'd read all of Jane Austen's novels and we were on the last one. And I had never done this with any other Jane Austen novel. So I'm saying that for anybody who's read Jane Austen and thinks like, I would never stay up and read Jane Austen for 24 hours. Persuasion, her last novel I sat and read in one night. I mean, I just didn't go to bed. Wow. I, I remember like sitting there in the chair and like the light is on. It's like three or four in the morning. I could not stop reading this novel. Did, and I was a full-time teacher. I mean, I was teaching fourth grade full-time. So it's not like I wasn't tired. <laughs> I was tired and I had to know what was going to happen in this novel. And I, I think that one in particular, because of, of the hook factor, you don't know exactly what's going to happen in that one. Um, I think anybody who reads Jane Austen, you know, there's going to be marriage at the end, but in that novel, she gets proposed to by three or four people. So you're constantly just like, what is she going to end up doing? (laughs) What's going to happen? And how is this heroine going to resolve uh, these, these questions and these situations and, and how is she going to get out of these problems? And you know, it's really hard to imagine that a happy ending can happen based on all the hurdles that happen in that novel. So that's that's definitely one that kept me. It's the one that I remember the most, probably the first time, just like staying up all night and not being able to put it down. Persuasion. All right. Yeah. So for me, similarly, it's a stage of life thing that kind of enables me to think about the the few of these that that this has been the case for. Um, And I think probably about 10 books across the span of my life as a reader fit this category. Um, But in the last nine years, there have been precious few because uh, with the introduction of children into our lives, um, Mm -hmm. just the opportunity, the sheer time to be able to do that. Um, So the one that comes to mind for me was about seven years ago, um, my wife, April, had taken, at the time, it was just our two girls, um, back to be with, with her parents for the weekend. And I had the whole weekend there at the house to myself. Um, and usually if I have just free pockets of time, that's that's reading time. You know, I, uh, I covet those. And I read uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's The Remains of the Day uh, mm-hmm. 
that somebody had, I, I, it had been recommended to me for years. Um, but it was the right time to read it. I had the time to read it. Uh, yeah. And meanwhile, what really moved me about it is the way that time is really a, a central character <laughs> in, in the story. Um, it is it is a book about uh, time <laughs> and, 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 and also about questions of, of loyalty uh, and, and commitment over against um, kind of uh, freedom and um, it's just it's a beautiful novel and it's one of those that is it's it's slow but every page is packed with potency to where even though you're not reading some gripping story you know that you are in the hands of a story that you have to get to the end of and the experience with it is so much more important than kind of the cognitive takeaway from it Mm -hmm. um so that's that's the book that, that that immediately comes to mind for me that was a kind of one sitting across the span of an entire day um the remains of the day mm. Mm. okay i've had that book on my shelf i think i have like four of his books on my shelf and it's been right. for like seven years and i've never read them very giant i was thinking that all right here. <laughs> well you know so then allow me to say that because of that experience with him I have gone and reread, not reread. I've gone and read most all of his, uh, and they're all so good that I cite him as one of my five or ten favorite uh, living living authors. Wow! But that began with the experience we just talked about. That's the sense I had of him of his work, which is why I buy a lot of books from a library, like used uh, store that's out front of the library. Um, and so I, every time I see one of his, I just buy it and keep it, even though I haven't read any. But I just have the sense that like they're going to be great when it happens one day. Um, well, my pick is uh, James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. Um, and I think for this one, I was partly encouraged by the form to read it in a day because the, the actual sort of present narrative timeline of the novel takes place in one day. It takes place through... Um, through the kind of evening uh, night Terry service into Sunday morning. So I think at sort of a plot level, um, you know, wanting to know what was going to happen, I was really gripped by the story, but also it felt really fitting at a sort of um, kind of just formal level to be immersed in the story along with the characters who were also kind of moving forward in the period of, of one day. So um, yeah, I think it's interesting maybe to think about the, you know, uh, sort of bandwidth that a reader has the nature of the plot, but then also maybe sometimes the form of the novel, obviously the length of the novel can encourage that sort of immersion and participation. Um, so yeah, Baldwin for me, I, li I like those answers. Well, I was just thinking about stage of life. I'm kind of adding a question on top of a question, but you know, I could do that single because no one was caring if I stayed up all night, like it didn't affect anybody but me as an apartment by myself. But even now I'm starting to remember you know, I have definitely been in hotels with my whole family asleep and I've stayed in the bathroom because that's the only place I could get a light. <laughs> and I've <laughs> and definitely reading. like sat there on the floor next to the bathtub just reading because I had to read. You know, I, I was thinking it was Chris Beha's The Index of Self-Destructive Acts. And like, I couldn't put that book down. I don't think I read it in a day because it was so big, but it was one of those books still that like I would sit on a hard cold floor in a bathroom in a hotel room just to, you know, you have to overcome. <laughs> that's an endorsement. It, 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 that's a true endorsement. And, and, and really it, and this is readers, what we read and live and hope for a book that grips us so much that we just cannot put it down. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll end this rich conversation on that and encourage y'all to stay tuned for this interview. This podcast is sponsored by Brazos Press. Brazos Press publishes books that creatively draw upon the riches of the Christian story to deepen our understanding of God's world and inspire faithful reflection and engagement. A Brazos Press book that I recommend is How to Inhabit Time, Understanding the Past, Facing the Future, Living Faithfully Now by James K.A. Smith. This book was named a Christianity Today Award finalist, and in the book, Smith helps Christians and the church develop a sense of temporal awareness that is attuned to the texture of history, the vicissitudes of life, and the tempo of the spirit. 
Smith shows that awakening to spiritual significance of time is crucial for orienting faith in the 21st century. Get 30% off and free shipping at bakerbookhouse.com. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Scandal of Reading podcast. My name is Claude Acho, one of the co-hosts, and I'm so thrilled to be joined today with Angel Parham. Uh, Angel is the Associate Professor of Sociology and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia. She works in the area of historical sociology, engaging in research and writing that examines the past in order to better understand how to live well in the present and envision wisely for the future. She's also the author of American Routes, Racial Pample Sets, and The Transformation of Race, which was published with Oxford and winner of numerous uh, awards. In addition to her research, she is active in public-facing teaching and scholarship, where she provides resources and training for K-12 through educators who are looking to better integrate Black writers and Black history into their teaching. And her most recent book is co-authored with Anika Prather and is entitled The Black Intellectual Tradition, Reading Freedom in Classical literature. This came out uh, in 2022, and uh, you all uh, should get a copy, especially as you're listening to this conversation. Uh, So Angel, it's a joy to have you on. Uh, Welcome. Thanks so much, Claude. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited about this. Um, and this is a, a, a treat, too, because I got to connect with you a week ago. So it's two weeks in a row, even though uh, we uh, we live uh, in the same uh, domain. Um, we don't always get to cross paths. So this is a pleasure uh, in that respect. But I know this will be uh, really helpful and enriching for our listeners, because we're going to talk about Phyllis Wheatley uh, in this conversation. And um I want to start by asking you to give us a little bit of a uh, a little bit of an orientation to Phyllis Wheatley, um, and a and a hint at some of the sort of misconceptions that sort of orbit um, this this really important figure in our country. And I can start by just saying I don't know a ton about Phyllis Wheatley other than uh, some of what I've been reading in your book. Um, but I I really go back to what I think I encountered in eighth grade, which was a really short excerpt of her poetry. Um, and a piece, uh, the piece about being brought from uh, Africa to America, and uh, which I think is probably her most, you know, generally well-known poem. And I remember uh, my my vague impression was that I heard parts of that poem, and some of my my classmates and I sort of had the impression that um, the poem was coming across as sort of. Um, giving thanks almost for, for slavery in a way. So I feel like not only um, did I not comprehend, but maybe I also wasn't uh, I also wasn't guided well in my introduction of Phyllis Wheatley. So can you give a little bit of a primer on Wheatley and some of the ways in which we, we ought to be thinking about uh, her work and, and what she uh, has contributed? Yes, I think that's a great place to start. And your introduction to Wheatley is, I think, pretty similar to the introduction that most people have. Um, they read or or assign that poem on being brought from Africa to America. And that's kind of the beginning and the end of it. And it doesn't, it it doesn't really help (laughs) with getting any deep sense of who she is. And I have speculated about why that is her most anthologized poem. It is, well, I think there might be two reasons. One, it's very short. Phyllis Wheatley is not the easiest poet to read. So her poetry is filled with literary classical allusions. They can, her poems can be very, very dense. And, um, you know, so just practically speaking, perhaps that poem is just short and easy to talk about for teachers who also may not have much of a background in Phyllis Wheatley. I would say that it's very common for people to interpret that poem as, oh, thank God I was kidnapped from the shores of Africa and brought to America so I could be a Christian. Mm. And that would really not be the way to understand Phyllis Wheatley, what she was about, what her feelings were about being kidnapped and enslaved. So I think, um, I guess, first, maybe I'll go back a little bit to you know, what we know of who she was, um, just kind of leading up to the poem. So she was taken from the West Coast coast of Africa in an area somewhere around Senegal. We we don't know exactly where, but somewhere around Senegal in West Africa. And it was a slaving trip where the agent who went on the trip was instructed to bring back 
um, as many healthy young black men as possible. Those were the instructions. And when he came back, um, he had several children and many girls and women. And so it was considered to be a very unsuccessful trip you know, certainly was unsuccessful for the Africans involved, um, but it was considered to be unsuccessful for the the white men slavers involved, as well as they didn't feel that they got the value that they wanted to get from kidnapping people. So she ends up in Boston, and the Wheatleys decide to buy her, to purchase her. And I, I stumble on that idea of buying and purchasing because we we're talking about people, but as it was, there was a market in people. And there are questions as to why they would have decided to take her home. She was about seven years old at the time. And the understanding that she was about seven comes from the fact that she was missing her two front teeth. And that is about the age one is when one is missing their two front teeth. The Wheatleys had lost a daughter of about the same age. And so contemporaries of the Wheatley family suggests that perhaps Susanna Wheatley, the mother, may have um, felt an emotional attachment with the young girl. Her name was not Phyllis at this point. In fact, they gave her the name of the slave ship that carried her over, which was called the Phyllis. You know, that's kind of a, a cruel irony, I think, to, to be named after the, the ship that brought you over. Yeah. So they, they think that Susanna Wheatley might have been attracted to this young girl because she had lost her own daughter at a similar age. So they bring her home and they learn fairly quickly that she is brilliant. She's very smart. She catches on to English very quickly. She starts figuring out how to read, you know, with no intentional instruction. And I would say to their credit, they cultivate this in her. Right. So they could have ignored it. They could have forbid it or subdued it. But instead, they did decide to go ahead and cultivate this in her, um, get her an education so she could learn how to read and um, give her time and space, which was highly unusual at this time. Um, I would also say, however, that um, the Wheatleys were a very prosperous family. And there's a kind of another um, perspective also on why they might have decided to go ahead and purchase Phyllis Wheatley, even though she was a very young um, girl, about seven years old. She was also somewhat sickly. So, you know, one wonders what what's the payoff here, kind of literally. Mm. Um, so the other thing to understand about um, the some of the wealthiest slave owners is that sometimes um, they thought of the enslaved Africans that they bought as being almost like, you know, kind of show pieces in, in the sense of, you know, a luxury good, for lack of a better term. And so that might also have been a factor. So there may have been emotional reasons. There may have been kind of status reasons that they decided to purchase Phyllis Wheatley. Um, but whatever the reason, at the very least, um, they did something right in terms of cultivating her intellect um, and her literary skills. So that's a bit of the background. Um, so she does not end up being kind of the typical um, house servant or so on. Contemporaries of the Wheatleys will talk about how, you know, she was there when they would come over and not necessarily in a serving capacity. Um, and that they seem to have um, kind of brought her into the family um, on terms that were unusual for an enslaved person. Now, that poem on being brought from Africa to America I think it's really important to understand that she was a very devout Christian. And so I think it's more along the lines of, you know, what um, humans meant for evil, God turned into good, right? And so that doesn't mean that, you know, just because things turned out well for that person, that, you know, God smiles on the evil that people do. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so the way I would read that poem, and I, and I would read that poem in light of her larger work, uh, her output in terms of poetry and letters. And what I know from her poetry and letters is that she was um, very critical of slavery, very critical of hypocritical white Christians, who she called out very specifically. 
um, and was very consistently on the side of liberty for her people. Mm. So knowing all of that, um, reading on being brought from Africa to America, my reading of that poem is, you know, yes, this was a, you know, this was a terrible thing that was done to me. Um, but I am grateful to have been exposed to the gospel to be a Christian. And also she puts herself and by extension, other Africans on an equality with white people. You know, at the end, she says, remember Christians, you know, Negroes black as Cain um, can can be redeemed and, and join the angelic train. So that's that's a paraphrase, not exactly what she said. But that's, that's almost exact. I have it in front of me. There's <laughs> like one, one thing off. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So she says, you know, we are just as worthy as you are. Remember that. Remember mm. that all Christians are equal on the side of God. And so she ends the poem saying, remember, we are all, you know, there is no male or female, um, Jew or Greek in the eyes of God. And there's no black or white. Um, you know, and, and I say that not to say that God doesn't care about cultural differences. So that's, right. that's not what I mean. But in the sense that the status markers that people have made artificial markers between races, God does not care about that. We are all equal before God. And so that is my reading of that poem. Um, and I think the misreading of it comes from the fact that there's such a superficial knowledge of Phyllis Wheatley, and it's just super easy to just say, okay, I checked that off the list. I, you know, I assigned a, a Wheatley poem. It's short, it's manageable, on to the next thing. Mm. That's extremely helpful, and it it, it reminds it, it reminds me of sort of the 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 simplicity, the reductionism that we can um, apply to historical figures. You know, I think about um, you know with MLK each you know each year around MLK uh, MLK Day, the sort of the quotes come out right, and then you people sort of gravitate towards you know the quote that fits best with with their sensibilities or or, or whatnot, um, it, rather than sort of thinking through a person's whole corpus, the evolution of thought, the context that they were um, they were in, uh, their conversation partners at the time and how those don't map exactly to what we deal with now, but but also speak to now, you know, all of these different factors. Um, so that that's really helpful the way you've drawn that out for us. And I, and I you know, it, it's interesting because I, I went and looked at a few of her poems uh, in preparation for this conversation. And uh, she's a, a wonderful, um, another wonderful poem, uh, A Hymn to the Evening. Um, and in this poem, she uses some of the same language that you uh, recited with near perfection um, in, uh, in the poem on being brought from uh, from Africa to America. And that last line about, um, you know, remember Christians, Negroes, Black as Cain may be refrained may be refined and join the angelic train. She uses that again in, um, and maybe she uses it all over, I, I don't know, uh, but she uses that again in A Hymn to the Evening. And it's really clear that she's speaking again of, of, of sort of everyone, that this is a pot, like that, that this is not a sort of derogatory thing that she's suggesting for her kinsmen, but rather this is this gift of mercy that she's calling white Christians to recognize is a gift to them and is also possible for all. So it was interesting even just by... For me, you know, going to another poem, it really helped enrich um, my understanding of this one. Um, but as as I was looking through uh, her her letters, it is it is clear, you know, she has this great line um, in, in a letter uh, where she writes, "In every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom." It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance, right? I'm, I mean, not telling you anything you you don't know, but for yeah. listeners, the, it, it's it's you know it's very clear, right? And so, um, so this is important for us as we think through these figures and what we can uh, learn from them to to try to deal with them um, in sort of the whole scope of their their corpus and their work. Um, but Willis uh, was also um, Wheatley was also. Uh, extremely prominent and popular in her day. Yeah. Um, and so are you able to kind of, can you speak a little bit to that, the fact of sort of her, her stature in, in colonial America and the value of her work and, and its impact in that particular moment for, for Americans and for African Americans? Yes. I mean, she was, you know, you can, as you might imagine, um, a young African 
who is publishing poetry <laughs> is going to stand out in the public imagination. Um, so yes, yeah, she was very, very well known. In fact, um, one of her poems that um, I wish people would turn to is her poem to the Earl of Dartmouth. Um, and this, this relates to her renown. So the Earl of Dartmouth um, had been appointed um, to an administrative post overseeing the colonies. He, he's English. And one of his assistants happened to be traveling in New England, and he had heard of Wheatley. Many people had heard of Wheatley. And so he finds himself in Boston, and he decides to go and pay her a visit. He says, you know, I've, I've heard about this, this Negro writer. I, I doubt she's really writing these poems. I think somebody else is writing these poems for her. And so he pays a visit, and he basically demands that she write a poem for him mm -hmm. on the topic of his choosing so that she can prove, you know, that she really is this poetical genius. And so he says, I want you to write a poem about my boss, the Earl of Dartmouth. <laughs> and wow. she's very politically savvy. She knows who Dartmouth is. She knows that he's just been appointed to this post overseeing the colonies. And she says, yeah, I can do that. No worries. Now, she takes it as an opportunity to write a poem that I, I just, I love this poem because what she does in it is she starts out in a very, very complimentary way to Dartmouth, but you see the political savvy in it. So um, is it all right if I read just a little bit? That would it? be... That would be fantastic, yes. Okay. Hail happy day when smiling like the morn, fair freedom rose New England to adorn. The northern clime beneath her genial ray, Dartmouth congratulates thy blissful sway. Elate with hope her race no longer mourns, each soul expands, each grateful bosom burns. While in thine hand with pleasure we behold, the silken reins and freedom's charms unfold. So what she does in the opening of this poem is she starts out talking about freedom, right? So one of the first things that comes across this idea of fair freedom rose in New England to adorn. And then she congratulates Dartmouth. She congratulates him on his new position and she says that, you know, those who are under his blissful sway, mm. right? You know, so she's already kind of setting things up to say, you know, I am sure that your rule, under your rule, this will be a blissful sway, right? It's not going to be oppressive. Um, and she says, you know, elate with hope, her race no longer mourns. Mm. And then she's, she um, characterizes him aspirationally, I would say, as having silken reins, while in thine hand with pleasure we behold the silken reins and freedom's charms unfold. Mm. So essentially what she's saying politically here is I realize you've just come into this post where you're going to be overseeing these colonies. And I'm so sure that you are going to be, <laughs> you know, someone who's in the cause of freedom, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh, you want me to write a poem to him? Yeah, let me write a poem. I have something I want to say. Um, and then she goes further uh, because later on in the poem, you know, she starts out by, she starts by talking about freedom. She ends by talking about freedom. Later in the poem, she says, should you, my Lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood. I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Mm. So there, you know, she's saying, yes, I care about freedom. I'm so glad that you are committed to freedom. And if you wonder why I care so much, it's because I was unjustly snatched from my parents in Africa. Um, and so, you know, to say that 
that poem on being brought from Africa to America is mm. in praise of being kidnapped and brought here is, is just, you know, completely misreads who Phyllis Wheatley was. Just, I, I think it's more a misinterpretation in terms of not understanding the cultural context or the history. Yeah, that is, um, I, I'm just so moved by the brilliance um, of, of that poem rhetorically. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you, you read that and, and walked us through that. What do you, um, as we kind of bring this to, to a close, making the connection explicitly to your recent work um, uh, with, with Dr. Prather, uh, on reading freedom in classical literature, the Black intellectual tradition is, is the technical title. Um, what what can we learn from from Wheatley? You know, as you've walked us through these two poems, as you as you've kind of opened up for us a, a fuller understanding, a truer understanding of, of sort of her her work and and her voice. How how does that? How, how do we then make the connection into in terms of what that can teach us now as we think about? Um, all the conversations about race, racial injustice, racism, all these different realities and, and different voices and things that are happening now. How can we learn? Uh, what would it look like for, for people today to learn from from Wheatley? Yeah, um, I think there's a very direct connection. Um, and I speak to this both in the book and, you know, in, in other speaking that I do on this topic, which is that, uh, you know, so much of what we are struggling with now at, at its root is this question about what is the American project? You know, is it fundamentally good? Is it fundamentally flawed? Um, is it kind of just irreparably oppressive, you know, given the history of genocide of Native Americans and enslavement of Africans? Um, we are still working through many of those issues. And I think it's helpful to look back at a life and legacy like Wheatley's because she was literally there at the founding of the American Project. She lived just down the road from the Boston Massacre. Um, she is an ardent um, adherent of the revolution and of freedom. And she's an ardent adherent of the revolution because she cares about the cause of freedom. I think she's helpful in that rather than her, she what she models for us is instead of a kind of either or, 1619 or 1776, which is how things have been boiled down now. Rather than that, she models for us um, an, an ability to hold together the tensions and the promises of the American project. So for the ideals, she's all for it. She supports it. And she says, yes, let's actually live those ideals. But she does not flinch from criticizing very severely where that is not happening. And, you know, we have many models in the Black intellectual tradition that do that. And part of why I care so much about the history, especially the 18th and 19th century history, is it seems today like we're having conversations as if none of that has happened in the past. Mm. As if mm. people who are really brilliant, like Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass and Du Bois, never existed, never went through this with a fine tooth comb. Um, People much more brilliant than we are have done this and lived this with excellence in their lives and their writings. And so I just can't understand why we wouldn't want to learn from what they've already done. And also, I think um, people like Phyllis Wheatley highlight for us the involvement of Black Americans in the founding, rather, right? rather than it being this, you know, oh, it's just... It, the American project is so alien from us, you know, it's, it's only meant to oppress us, but there were black Americans who were very, very active, mm. and, you know, they're at the founding. And so why not claim that, you know? Mm. So certainly things have not always worked out to the good of Africans and African Americans. Certainly there were plenty at the founding who did not believe in our full humanity. Um, absolutely. But why then just discount all the work that these other great ancestors did who held to their, the feet to the fire of white Americans and said, this will not stand. This freedom is for all of us. So to me, in repudiating the American project 
completely or saying that it's irredeemable, you know, it, it just dismisses what people like Wheatley and Douglas and others did. Mm. Mm. Where can people, uh, where, where can people begin with, with Wheatley if, if they're interested? I, I, in so many ways, you've already given us a great start. Um, yeah. So certainly the poems that, that you've mentioned, um, are there other places you, you would suggest for people to begin to, to, to jump into, delve into her work um, as they hear this and go forward? Yes, I mean there are there are a lot of of good sources. Uh, I would recommend um, getting her completed works, and that is you know that might seem like oh well you know I'm not really <laughs> you know committed to, <laughs> to weekly scholarship, but it's, it's very hard to understand her without it, and and it's not very intimidating honestly. Mm. Um, so I would get her complete works because that should include her letters. Okay. You really can't fully understand her without reading those letters. Mm. And in a sense, you could almost even start with the letters because that just allows you, there, there aren't so many letters either, you know, it, it allows you to just kind of get into her mind, into her context and to see how incredibly smart she is. So you get her letters to white benefactors that are very formal, very flowery. Um, and you know, I think very smart, that's what you want to do in that kind mm -hmm. of letter, but you also get her letters to Ober Tonner, who was another, mm -hmm. um, young African woman who was living in the area. And she talks to her as a friend and an equal. And so you get a completely mm -hmm. different view of her, you know, as a young African woman. And then you have, um, her letter to Samson Ockham, who was a native American missionary, um, who again, you know, she's communicating with him, like they're commiserating on the rights of Native Americans and Africans. Wow. Yeah. And the fight for freedom. And they're both Christians and the need for Christians to really be Christians. Wow. Um, you know, so those letters are so important. And, and as I said, her poetry is fairly dense. She was a very learned woman. Um, you know, she studied Latin. She, she studied all this classical literature. It's dense with literary allusions. And so it, it might actually be easier to start, get her complete works, start with the letters, and then start making your way through some of the poetry. Um, so that's what I would suggest. And then, of course, there are biographies. Um, Vincent Carreta has a, a very nice biography, um, very easy to follow, really wonderful. Um, and, and there are others. Um, another one. So this is a book that um, I have been enjoying a lot. Oh, wow. And um, so it is The Age of Phyllis by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. She's a poet. And so yeah. she's an African-American poet. Yeah. And so it's really fascinating to see how an African-American poet in the 21st century um, thinks through Wheatley. And what she does is she poetically, so in the form of poetry, this book is in the form of poetry, um, considers Wheatley's life and legacy. And so she intersperses her poetic reflections with um, Wheatley's own letters and poetry. Hmm. Um, and she uses it also as a commentary on today's politics of race and justice. So, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. But I, I would start with Wheatley herself, looking at the, you know, if one's intimidated by the poetry with those letters, pick a few poems, read the biography, and then maybe look at um, Jeffers's um, poetic reflections on Wheatley. That is great, and I'll um, commend to listeners again to uh, to pick up uh, your work as well, the Black Intellectual Tradition: Reading Freedom in Classical Literature. If uh, if folks, what you've heard today has been helpful and inspiring, which I'm sure it has been. Um, You'll only have more if you come to uh, to, to get Angel uh, Angel's book, and it'll give uh, an overview of many different figures um, in in our in our history uh, and their voices and their contributions. Um, Frederick Douglass, uh, Julia Cooper, many others. So I encourage folks to to check that out. Get that wherever you uh, wherever you get books. Um, Angel, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, and before we uh, before we depart, is there a way that listeners can keep up with your work or follow along with different projects or things that you're doing? Sure, that would be great. Um, you can visit my website, which is just my name, Angel Parham, 
The last name's P is in Paul, A-R-H-A-M is in Mary, dot com. Great. We'll we'll link to that and the books uh, in the show notes. So definitely, folks, uh, you, if you've you've heard me on the podcast, you know I don't believe in a book budget. Um, so hopefully, these recommendations will uh, will help you in the cause of uh, abolishing such things. Um, pick these uh, pick these texts up. Um, uh, it's a wonderful conversation, Angel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This podcast is sponsored by Brazos Press. Brazos Press publishes books that creatively draw upon the riches of the Christian story to deepen our understanding of God's world and inspire faithful reflection and engagement. A Brazos Press book that I recommend is the August 2023 release, The Evangelical Imagination, How Stories, Images, and Metaphors Created a Culture in Crisis by Karen Swallow Pryor. In the book, Pryor analyzes the literature, art, and popular culture that has surrounded evangelicalism. She unpacks the movement's most deeply held concepts, ideas, values, and practices to consider what is Christian rather than merely cultural. Pre-order now and get 40% off and free shipping at bakerbookhouse.com.